Hello, everyone. I'm just uh, making sure we're live, <laughs> just on my screen. Yes, I think we are live. Um, so, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to um, our next uh, online whiskey tasting, which is one that I've been looking forward to, as have a lot of you. Um, in cracks, I've had a lot of messages as well from people saying that they're really excited about this evening, which is fantastic. Um, love Japanese whiskey, love Nikka. Um, and this has been one we've kind of had in the works for a few months actually, and it just kind of keep getting delayed. And then here we are, finally. Um, as you guys coming in, if you can just put some comments in, which a few of you are great, Matthew, Tim, which is great. Um, and I think usually I, I sort of disappear off just to have a look around social media and make sure we can find everyone. But everyone has confirmed that they got the email this morning with the link. Um, so I know roughly how many people to look out for on our stream. We've got quite a few people watching from the same household as well, so I'll bear that in mind. Um, but it is pretty much a sold-out tasting, which is uh, fantastic. That's what we always like. Um, hope everyone's doing okay throughout this um, second lockdown. Um, I think it's the first risky one since it went into lockdown, so who knew? Again, we're here. Uh, still a few more weeks to go but we should get by with um, some fantastic whiskey. Um, we have two brand ambassadors joining us today from uh, NICA. So we've got uh, Stephanie Holt and Nathan Shearer. Um, who's kind of going up there Friday evening to join us uh, and talk about this um, fabulous whiskey. And not only that, we have two uh, UK exclusives, uh, which is why I told a few of you that I knew um, obviously had a lot of nickel before, but I said you had to join this tasting just to obviously get in there first with these um, new drams. Um, so I will, without further ado, bring Jas on uh, and he can sort of do a little brief intro, introduce the guys, and then we'll get going um, so you guys can get some whiskey in your glass um, and start enjoying the evening. So have fun, guys, and I will just bring Jas on. He's praying. So let the signal work. Oh, right. yeah. It's divine. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So I think everyone is okay. I'll, I'll let you get on with it, and I'll just check. But looking at numbers, I think we're all in anyway. So we can we can obviously get going. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, as Shane said, lots of good stuff tonight. Um, joined by. Those of you that have met Stephanie before know, know you're in for a good night. And we're joined by Nathan as well, who I'm sure is equally as good. Um, and we've got six amazing whiskies to try tonight. Um, so I, I, I think we should just get on with it um, and in, in bring in Stephanie and Nathan. Hey. <laughs> How you doing? Hey guys, how you doing? Yeah, very good. Thanks, you. Good, thanks. It gives me a countdown. How nice. Oh, yeah, it gave you a count. Exactly. <laughs> Three, yeah. two, one. I was like... The countdown is there so you don't get caught like okay. I did. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, look, so look, I'm going to pass I'm going to pass you guys over to uh, Stephanie and Nathan and um, hear all about the wonderful world of Japanese whiskey. Thank you very Great. much. Um, so we'll do a quick introduction to ourselves first, maybe. And um, hi to everyone I've met before doing tastings with you guys. Um, so I'm Steph. Uh, I am uh, one of the whiskey ambassadors. Nathan is the other one uh, of a company called Speciality Brands. And so we import and distribute lots of small, uh, really well-made uh, high-end spirits and occasionally a vermouth or two uh, to the UK. So we get to saunter around the country. Well, not anymore. Um, we get to talk about <laughs> delicious things. And um, yeah, I think Nathan's actually our big Japan geek. Uh, I, I started as the first whiskey ambassador and Nathan came on after me. But he's the one who's a little bit more into, um, I think, Japanese culture, food, clothing um, and things. Denim, right? ramen, all of that stuff. <laughs> Denim and ramen <laughs> is essentially his life. Um, <laughs> So um, a little bit of whiskey as well. <laughs> a bit of whiskey. So yeah, we thought we'd do it. And this is actually our first tasting together because uh, usually we are sort of sent to different corners of the country uh, doing different things. So it might be a bit uh, weird. <laughs> Apologies for anyone who, who thinks it doesn't flow nicely because uh, that will be because we're, you know, we're just chatting. It's Friday. 
we've got this it's great that's it exactly exactly <laughs> So just um, just a little note before we do start, um, Nathan's going to lead us into a bit of history of Japan and Japanese whiskey. Um, but uh, you've got six samples, which I think everyone is delighted by. We are going to try and introduce you to Japanese whiskey um, and the history of it a bit first. Now, it is a bit of a longer introduction than maybe you're used to. Um, so, but please try not to drink all the whiskeys um, until we kind of get ready because we have sort of put them in a specific order for a reason and they sort of go, I think they taste a lot better once you've heard the, the information that goes with them. So if you've got number one in your glass, that's fine. Uh, have a little sniff, have tiny, tiny sips if you can. Um, and then we will let you know when we're ready to, uh, to properly get into it. All right. Awesome. So I guess I'll I'll kick off then. Um, <laughs> is it possible to share the presentation? Would that be okay? We've got some pictures for you guys. You know, so. I yeah, I think Anyone so. who's seen me before knows I love a map. So uh, yeah, as I have one behind me. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we've got the screen there. Um, so yeah, I'm Nathan. Uh, I look after Nico in the UK with Steph, and I've always kind of focused a lot more on the the more geeky side of things. Um, so we will talk a little bit about all the different distillation methods and all of the kind of nuts and bolts of Japanese whiskey. But before we talk about the whiskey in Japan, we kind of need to look a little bit um, about how whiskey got there and you know why J Japan is so well known for making whiskey. Now, when I first started drinking whiskey, when someone mentioned Japanese whiskey to me, I was a bit like, wait a minute, how, why, why are the Japanese making whiskey? How are they doing this? Surely they don't have all the resources. And I think that was probably the attitude of most, most people. Like in the West, and especially in the UK, we come from, you know, where whiskey is from. Whiskey is Irish and Scottish, and that's how we view a lot of the whiskey world. It's all based around here. And when we think about Japan, the first thing that comes to mind is normally something that looks a little bit like this. So we think about, you know, pagodas and Mount Fuji, and we think about Zen and elegance, and then sushi, sake, samurais, and all of this very, very different world. But obviously these days, whiskey can be made anywhere. You know, you can have Welsh whiskey, Taiwanese whiskey, Indian whiskey, South African whiskey, Australian whiskey. So Japan isn't a new whiskey making country. Whiskey's been made in Japan for nearly 100 years, but it's obviously come a very, very different way to a lot of those other countries. So what I mean by that is, if we look at the main whiskey producing countries of the world, you can see them in red here. We've got the UK and Ireland. So like we said, whiskey Mecca, this is where the single malts, the blends, the Irish pot stills, the grain whiskies, that's where they originated. And then through trading routes with the, the British East India Company and the BOC, spirits kind of spread around the globe. And then settled in places like, or whiskey settled in places like the US, Canada, and now India. Now, these countries all have a few things in common, which mean that they're really well suited to whiskey production. The first thing being lots and lots of wide open land where we can grow lots of cereal grains. So corn, rye, barley, oats, spelt, all of those things you can make bread with, which was our staple diet, and you can also turn those things into whiskey. Japan is not blessed with lots of wide open prairie land and spaces and meadows. It's a really inhospitable country. About 90% of the people in Japan live on 5% of the land. So things like rice grow really well, and that's why the Japanese diet and the Japanese alcohols are based on rice. So we had lots of cereal grains, we made beer and whiskey, the Japanese had lots of rice, they made sake and they made shochu. But also, Japan didn't get whiskey um, for a very long time and much later than most other countries because they had a policy of isolationism from you know, 1605 all the way up into the middle of the 1800s. They saw what was happening in the rest of Asia, which was the British and the Dutch and the Spanish and the Portuguese conquering everything. And the Japanese kind of went, nope, not today. I'm not playing with this. So they shut themselves out. And so there was no Western influence in Japan for about 250, 300 years. So that meant that if you wanted to get drunk in Japan, you had a few options. You had sake, you had shochu, and you had some other beverages like awamori and things like that. That's what the Japanese drunk. Now, if we fast forward to the middle of the 1800s, Japan's a little bit behind the rest of Asia. They need to industrialize. And to do that, they have to open up the borders. And obviously, when they open up the borders, trade starts. So we have you know, the British bringing the sherries, the rums, the gins, all of the, the whiskies in. You had the Americans bring in whiskey. You had all of these brand new spirits that were entering Japan, and everyone went mental for them. Yeah, you know, It's the first time they'd seen 
40 plus percent alcohol. The first time they tasted elegant blended whiskeys, the first time they would have tasted all of these very, very different styles of spirits. So everyone started clamoring to get them, but they were just a little bit too expensive and there wasn't enough. So this is where we start to see the Japanese alcohol producers trying to make whiskey and they were not very good at it at all. They were making sake, they were adding grain alcohol to it, putting loads of caramel into it and going, this is whiskey. And that's kind of how Japanese whiskey started. Now, thank God, this gentleman was born and he started a bit of a revolution in Japanese whiskey. So this is Masataka Takatsuru. So he is the father of Japanese whiskey. And also we're really lucky because he's the founder of the Nika Distilling Company as well. So Takatsuru was born into a family of sake makers in 1894. And so from a young age, he was around alcohol. He was brewing sake with his father. He was tasting the sake. He was blending. He was learning all about the sales. And he had a really promising career taking over the family business. So in order to do that, he would need to go and do a bit of studying in the nearest big city, which was Osaka. And this is where he started working for another brewery and learning a bit more about Western spirits. Now, Western spirits were new. They were different. They were fun. They were exotic. And Takatsu fell in love with this style of Western liquor. And with the company, he agreed that he was going to go all the way to Scotland to learn about whiskey making. And so I'll hand over to Steph to do the nice romantic Scottish part. <laughs> Thanks. Since I'm in Scotland right now, um, it makes sense. So Takatsu uh, was sent over to Scotland in 1918. Um, and obviously the plan was to learn how to make whiskey. But also, uh, as, as nowadays, the easiest way to get a visa is to study at university. So he applied to Glasgow University to study kind of uh, biochemistry, food science. Um, he'd already studied it in Japan um, and got a position. He was the first Japanese person to study in Glasgow. So people were very excited to meet him. Um, and obviously, in the meantime, he was thinking of writing to distilleries uh, and trying to get some work with them. Uh, that picture Nathan just showed a second ago, actually, is one of my favorites. It's shown at the museum that they have um, at the distillery uh, in Japan, uh, Yoichi. And uh, there's a, a whole museum about Takitsuri and his life and, and the beginnings of Japanese whiskey. And this picture has the caption there of Takitsuri arrives in Scotland. Hopefully everyone recognizes that building as uh, Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. So London. But they're like, it's the same, same, same. Um, so uh, he arrives in Glasgow to study um, and at the same time he's writing to distilleries. Now you've got to remember in those days, these little guys working at distilleries, I mean, obviously there's still occasionally when you go to a Scottish distillery, a wee sort of, you know, a hundred year old looking man sort of stomping around doing the job he's done for years and years and years. But also, um, you know, nowadays we have quite a lot of, uh, you know, younger people are a bit more interested in uh, kind of the global uh, story of whiskey. Uh, whereas in those days, everyone didn't really understand. So this Japanese person is writing letters uh, to all these distilleries like, hello, can I come and do some work experience with you? Can I come and learn how to make whiskey for me? And they're all like, this must be a joke. What is this letter? This is nonsense. Um, so he didn't get any responses uh, initially, but eventually he did actually get some work experience at Longmorn Distillery. So the one on the top right there um, in Speyside. And so here he went uh, to work and he learned a lot about how to make obviously single malts uh, from the beginning um and just generally sort of getting to know these whiskey guys getting to know almost the industry and i think through meeting these guys they had connections for him at these other distilleries because his letters were not were not doing what he wanted them to do i think uh, japanese culture really polite everyone would have replied to a letter immediately <laughs> whereas in scotland i think they were just binning them um so after working um, at Longmorn and learning how to make uh, single malts, he also then went and got a job um, at a, another distillery. So the one on the bottom right here is uh, actually called, it's called Bowness. It was called James Calder. Um, it's just uh, between Edinburgh and Glasgow. And you probably won't have heard of this one um, because this is actually a grain whiskey distillery and actually closed down in the 1930s. So you're not going to find any old vintage single malts or anything from there. And actually, if you have already launched into spirit number one, then that's fine. This is the one that sort of will link to this distillery a little bit later when we explain it. OK, so if you want to take a wee taste now, then do. But I'll explain the whiskey that you're tasting in just a sec. Um, so um, he learned here how to make grain whiskies and they're using it, obviously, completely different types of stills, different types of grains, uh, different production methods. And obviously the point of what they were for. 
He then got some work at Hazel Brand, so in the bottom left there in uh, Campbelltown. And here he learned how to make single malts in a different way from up at Longmore, and obviously coastal style. Uh, so there's all kinds of different things happening there. But also Campbelltown and Glasgow were both massive, massive global centers of whiskey blending at this stage. So he's being taught about blending. And you've got to remember that in those days, blended whiskey was king. Up until the 1960s, blended whiskey was the cool thing to drink, the thing that rich people drank, the thing that educated people drank. Because um, if you were poor and lived in Scotland, you drank a local single malt. It was made in batches. It tasted different every time. And it didn't have a nice brand name and a nice bottle. It was just, you know, made, <laughs> shoved into whatever vessel you had and um, named after the nearest valley or river or whatever. OK, so Takitsu was really, really immersed into this world of blended whiskey. And obviously the idea of the art of blending really appealed to his Japanese sensibilities of wanting things to be balanced and have harmony. OK, so that's all the kind of style of things that he's learning. Now, he's a busy boy. He's not just there working at a bunch of different distilleries and studying at Glasgow Uni. He is also courting while he's there. And this is like to do the love story bit, you see. So uh, <laughs> he meets this lovely lady, Rita. Um, he was the elder sister of one of his classmates at university. Um, and she, he's invited around to the family home of his classmate, technically to meet his younger brother, because he's been bullied at school and Takatsura has offered to teach him jiu-jitsu. But I think he must have been invited to every classmate's house for dinner because he was the first Japanese person studying in Scotland. Everyone must have been like, no, no, you must come and meet my family there for this and that and they get a reason. OK, so anyway, he gets to the um, the household uh, containing Rita. Her full name is Jessie Roberta Cowan. Um, now, her dad had died the year before. He was a doctor in the Kirk and Tillich area just outside of Glasgow. And um, they were also looking for lodgers. They were looking for students to live in their house, to pay a bit of rent, to make up some of the, the money that they weren't bringing in anymore, not having a doctor's salary paying anymore. So he eventually moves in with this family and gets to know the daughter, yes, they fall in love and they marry in 1920. Now, neither of the families were delighted. Um, interracial marriage in Scotland in those days was obviously pretty rare, but in Japan it was even rarer. So they both kind of went against their family wishes initially by doing this, but um, he'd explained his dream of making whiskey in Japan. Rita was fully on board with that and uh, they decided to do it together. So both families did get much happier with their marriage later on as it proved very successful. But initially they were kind of, um, they were up against it. Okay, where have we got to? All right, so late 1920, Takitsuru takes his lovely new wife back to Japan to meet her in-laws. She's never met them before. Um, and obviously the plan is for him to start making whiskey. And Nathan, I think we're back to you now. Yes. So yeah, Takitsuru brings back you know, a wife he brings back all this knowledge that didn't exist in Japan before, all about kind of Scotch whiskey production. And obviously straight away, he wants to get to work. Now, during sort of the 1918, 1919, there's obviously been a world war going on. And Japan was a very new emerging economy. So a world war is going to completely destabilize that economy. And so the money to build a whiskey distillery wasn't there anymore. So the company Takatsu was working for kind of shoved him off and, you know, made him brew beer and brew sake and things like that, but he wanted to make whiskey. This was all he cared about doing. So he needed to find a new investor. Um, so this investor came in the form of a very happy looking gentleman here called Shinjiro Tori. Now, if anyone has been interested in Japanese whiskey or done a bit of research or kind of looked at you know, any of the history of Japanese whiskey before, you'll recognize the name Shinjiro Tori as the founder of the Suntory Whiskey Company. Now, these days, Suntory and Nika have a slightly better relationship than they have in the past, but they're still very much the two kind of opposing forces in Japanese whiskey. But it wasn't always like that. Shinjiro Tori actually hired Masataka Takatsuru to be the first master distiller, general manager, and all-round distillery person for Japan's first single malt distillery, which was called Yamazaki. Now, Yamazaki, um, I'm sure mo many of you will have tried it before. It's an absolutely delicious whiskey, um, but it's very, very different in style to what Nika was doing. And this is part of the reason why Nika decided to, to split off from Suntory and why Takatsu decided to go out on his own. It's because the style of whiskey that Shinjiro Tori wanted to make was so different. 
So Yamazaki Distillery was set up down in the southwest part of Japan, just outside Kyoto. Um, and this was a very, very different kind of climate to Scotland. It had different water. It was nothing like Scotland at all. It's about 45 degrees in the summer. Um, Scotland gets to about five degrees in the summer, so we're not quite in the same ballpark. Takatsuru had the idea of opening up a distillery way up in the north of Japan, though. So this was kind of the main sticking point between the two of them. So Takatsuru bit his lip for a while, um, and he worked at Yamazaki as the master distiller, actually released Japan's first real whiskey called Shirofuda, or White Label. Um, but after 10 years, his contract was up, and the company decided, or Takatsuru decided to part ways and start his own whiskey company. So when I kind of look at all of the feuds and the, the fighting between Takatsuru and Tori, location. And when you see a map of Japan, we kind of see it as well, it's a fairly small chain of islands. So the difference between the location of Yamazaki and the location of um, Takatsuru's preference, Yoichi, doesn't look that big. But then you see how big Japan is on a map of Europe, and you're like, oh, this is slightly bigger than I thought it was. So the difference between, or the distance between Yamazaki and Takatsuru's preference was about 12, 1300 miles. So a huge difference in climate, a very different kind of you know, maturation cycle, and it was a very, very different type of land up there as well. So Takatsuru, after 10 years of working at Yamazaki, goes all the way to the north and sets up his own distillery called Yoichi. So we've got a little map here which shows where Yoichi is. And Anthony, so that last slide, Nathan, sorry, Anthony uh, has just mentioned there's a TV series called Masa, which you should all watch. So, yeah, perfect timing. Uh, that's about uh, the Rita and Takitsuri love story, in case everyone is feeling romantic today. It's really good lockdown watching because they're only like 12, <laughs> 13 minute episodes and they're very, very quick. And you can kind of just watch all 175 of them on YouTube, I think. <laughs> I think I got to about 30 or 35 in. I need, need a break. I might start again. It's, very, it's quite cheesy. It's quite cheesy. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's on um, the, the Japanese version of BBC. So it's, it's very PC and it's very well to do, but it's quite entertaining. So if you do have time, and you fancy a couple of drums watching my son, I would recommend it. Yeah. So, so yeah, they um, the it's a, it's a oh, sorry, carry on, Nathan. <laughs> no, God, sir. I was saying it's a government uh, TV station, so they're not allowed to talk about a specific company. So, um, you know, they've had to call her Ellie. They've had to call the company something else um, uh, and him Masan rather than Masataka. Um, but it is totally based on their lives. So, yeah, there you go. Carry on. Uh, and yeah, that, that TV show is part of the reason why we don't have age statements on Japanese whiskey anymore. So it's um, yeah, a blessing and a curse. It's really good for Nika, which ended up being terrible for us that like drinking Nika. Um, so Yoichi, uh, you can see this kind of photo here. So all of these red roofed buildings, that's the distillery buildings. And then you've got the, the Yoichi River, which runs through Yoichi town and into the Sea of Japan. So this is a really coastal style of distillery. And one of the reasons that Takatsuru kind of came all the way up to the north of Japan was because he was searching for something similar to Hazelburn, similar to Campbelltown, where him and Rita had spent five really, really great months learning about whiskey production and starting their lives together. So Yoichi was kind of Takatsuru's homage to Scotland. And the whiskey they produce at Yoichi is a really kind of big, rich, bold, and very traditional type of single malt. Now, we're not tasting that one yet. That's going to come a little bit later. But when we're talking about Yoichi, it's really important important that we talk very, very briefly about some of the basic differences between a single malt that's made in Japan and a single malt that's made in Scotland. So we can turn up and down the geek on this one, but we'll keep it quite above board for this one. So this is a basic recipe of how you make a single malt, and this applies to making a single malt anywhere. So you've got what I like to say is six distinct steps. Step one is malting your barley. So that's your raw material. Now, malting your barley is just a way to make sure that you can extract the maximum amount of sugar out of your brewery, out of your starch. But malting the barley is also where you can introduce smoke. So depending on how you dry the barley after the malting process, whether you dry it over hot air or whether you dry it over a peat fire, that's going to kind of show you what kind of whiskey you're going to make. So this is a really important step. Then step two, we've got milling, where we just crush the barley. Step three is mashing. So this is where we extract the sugar. So imagine it like a big bowl of porridge. You throw in some hot water. The hot water leaches all of that sugar out, and we've got ourselves a sugary liquid. Step four, 
fermentation, something that we all learned in school. Yeast eats the sugar, gives us carbon dioxide and ethanol. I thought this was really boring when I was learning it. Then I realized this is quite literally the only reason I have a job today, this one small equation. After fermentation, we've got ourselves a fairly strong beer. And now we're going to take away the water through distillation in the pot stills, and then we're going to mature it. So that's our single malt recipe. If we're in Scotland, there's 150 or so different distilleries. Now, each one of those distilleries has its style. And that means that they tend to focus on the same recipe all the time to ensure consistency. Now, in Japan, bear in mind, when Takatsu sets up Yoichi, there are two distilleries in Japan. They want to blend whiskey, but they need lots and lots of different types of whiskey. Now, those distilleries aren't speaking to each other. So there's no way they can borrow casks or kind of swap anything. So the only thing to do is for them to create as many different types of whiskey as possible. So with Nika at the malting stage, they use four different peat levels in the barley. So they go from unpeated, so no smoke, to heavily peated. So from there, we can make four different types of whiskey. The yeast strains, they have about 10 different types of yeast strains. So each of those different yeast strains can give us a different flavor in fermentation. So the aim of the game at Nika is to create as much complexity as possible by changing all of these little steps. So at Yoichi and at Miyagi-kyo, they make over 600 individual types of new make before they go into cask. So this, just, this is one of the key differences between a single malt from Japan and a single malt from Scotland. Now we will taste the single malts, but just hold on, I promise we're gonna to get to the whiskey bit in just a second. So Yoichi was set up in 1934, distillation began in 1936, and then the first whiskey was actually brought out in 1940, just before Japan got involved in World War II. Not a great time for the whiskey industry. Well, the lead up was very good because the war meant that they couldn't get any um, export or imported whiskey. So no one was buying Irish whiskey or Scotch whiskey or American whiskey. So Japanese whiskey production soared and you had a huge amount of people buying it. And then the government decided that barley should be used for food, not for whiskey. But this is kind of a really interesting part where Rita comes in because Rita was actually teaching English to the Admiral of the Japanese Navy's son. Now the Japanese Navy took a lot of cues from the British. So what rum is to the British Navy, Japanese whiskey was to the Japanese Navy. So Nika were able to have a little contract whereby they got the supply of the Japanese Navy's barley and they exchanged that for whiskey. This allowed Nika to keep producing during the war. So Stephanie, we're gonna head over to you now for some grain whiskey. Yeah, um, thank you. So uh, we are getting ready to taste whiskey number one if you haven't all finished it already. Uh, thank you for your patience if you haven't. Um, so uh, Takitsu, as we just Nathan just explained, uh, is making as many different types of single malt as he can at his single distillery. But obviously the plan is to make blends. And so when you are blending, you don't just need lots of different types of single malts. You also need something called grain whiskey. Um, I'm sure quite a lot of you are familiar with the differences, but just going to quickly mention, just in case, um, the single malts, quite a lot of the rules are in the name, which is dead handy. So single means from one distillery only, and malt means it has to be 100% malted barley. The rule that's not in the name that actually is quite important in this uh, time is uh, that it has to be batch distilled, so distilled in a pot still. And um, those are kind of the sexy, copper, curvaceous things that you'll go to distilleries and see. Now, grain whiskey is distilled in a different way. And as the name implies, it can be made from any grain you like. Well done, Georgina. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, oh, here we've got a comparison. So the pot stills are on the right. Um, and uh, they, like I say, are how you make single malts. Now, when you're making a grain whiskey, you can use any type of grain you like. So you've got malted barley, but you'd be a bit mad to use malted barley, to be honest, because it's an expensive grain, because all the single malt distilleries want it. So if you want to make a nice grain whiskey, and usually you're thinking the grain whiskey is the cheap part of your blend, you're going to use a cheaper grain if you can. So things like corn or wheat or rye or whatever's cheapest that month. And some, some grain distilleries will buy different grains throughout the year, depending on the market. So, but the main difference is grain, dis, grain whiskies are distilled in a column still. And that's the picture on the left in the screen, uh, the slideshow there. It is not a pretty still, and actually that's only just a small section of it because they're usually tall and hideous and very industrial looking. 
Um, and there is a really bad diagram of one as well. It's beautiful. It's very scientific. Yeah. Don't, if you know how, like, you know, you get um, oil up from the North Sea and then you split it off into petrol and the various other components, this is the same method. So it does seem quite industrial. You're just, again, using heat to separate things out, but you're doing it continuously. And this way of distilling was invented by an Irishman called Mr. Coffee. Well, he might have stolen the idea from a German mine, but he published it first, so he wins um, in the 1830s. And so that's why the still is named after him. Now, the funny thing is that nowadays in Scotland, people don't really still use these stills because they've, as with everything from the 1830s, they've taken that technology and sort of improved upon it, made it more efficient, made it cheaper to operate, uh, and made it kind of, in some instances, better, in some instances, less good. So it is more efficient, it is cheaper and easier to operate now, a modern column still, uh, but a coffee still, will give you a little bit more flavor because of those inefficiencies at 1830s technology. So um, what Nika are doing, and Takitsuru shipped these stills over from Glasgow in the 1960s. And these are what he'd been working on, actually at that distillery I told you about earlier, Bowness um, or James Calder near Edinburgh. They closed down the 1930s. Now we're not sure, I don't think it's in any way a fact, um, but I like to think that the stills from that closed distillery might have been the ones that ended up in Japan because everyone was ditching their coffee stills from the 1930s up until the 1960s um, and they weren't being used at all because everyone was buying modern column stills instead. But Takitsu realized if you want to make a blend, you can make a good blend using a rubbish, horrible grain whiskey, if you like. You've got to be very careful though. But if your grain whiskey itself is delicious in the first place, it's very, very hard to make a bad blend from that. And that was kind of what he was going for. So we're now tasting officially, well done, if you've waited, um, the whiskey number one, which is the one on the left on the slide, and it is Nika Coffee Grain Whiskey. Um, and so this one is um, made in that coffee still, that's why they've got the word coffee on the label. That is annoying for quite a lot of us in Britain or America, because obviously a lot of people will think, thank you, Nathan, very nice, Debbie McGee there. Yeah. <laughs> showing the bottles um but um a lot of people read coffee uh, and as i think we're having a little bit of a joke on the comments about spelling and stuff um that it's made or flavored with coffee the bean or the drink and it is not it's got that y on the end um and it is the irish surname instead so it's nothing to do with coffee it does not taste of coffee if any of you're getting coffee tasting notes then your brain is very much overpowering your, your tongue right now um so this whiskey is made from corn, mostly sweet corn, 95% sweet corn, 5% malted barley in there, um, fermented like a what you'd call a normal whiskey, and then distilled in this modern column, uh, this sort of traditional, sorry, column still, not a modern column still, in a very inefficient way, which means you keep a lot of texture and a lot of flavor in. So actually in the flavors, you can really taste the corn. So everyone should be getting uh, smells and tastes from the way this has been made. Now, it's also been aged for an average of 12 years in American oak. And for me, the first flavors that come through come from the American oak. So you get things like vanilla, butterscotch toffee. Um, then you also get some flavors of coconut and you get some flavors of, say, um, you know, toasted bread, burned toast. And that's because the American oak barrels have been charred on the inside before they're used. But once you get used to those flavors or on the palate, then you start tasting the corn. And so I get flavors of, um of butter think of buttered sweet corn popcorn um also citrus is quite a good one for me like marmalady um and then you'll also get some flavors of oh i forgot the other one hold on i usually say three pineapple mango pineapple yes tropical fruits thank you nathan that's it tropical fruits because i've not got any so annoying um so um so yeah tropical fruits and citrus so those last three flavors the butter the tropical fruits and the citrus are coming more from the corn so if ever someone's distilled something from corn you should look out for those flavors but the, the texture of the butter is what i'd like you to all look out for on the palate so this one really spreads across the tongue and really coats it and stays there once you swallow it so even though this might be a lighter whiskey in style than you're used to if you used to drink in a single malt um it is, it is light, a grain is designed to be light, but that texture is there. And obviously when you're making a blend, that's gonna help build the bridges between all the different single malts that you're mixing in together to make sure they all kind of merge beautifully and marry, okay? So we're getting some good taste of notes coming through. We've got a bit of rum-like action. Yes, it is, it's like an aged um, uh, Spanish style rum, definitely. So again, you've got sort of 
column still action and you've got that Amer- used American egg pass. We've got some orange and cinnamon. Um, and so, yeah, and it does last for quite a long time. And usually grain whiskies are much more watery, much more light, disappearing much faster. So that's kind of the main thing about this one. Like I said, Packet Siri designed all of this for making blends. Anyone else got any notes? Or are we all right? Anything I've missed out, Nathan? It's 45% ABV. Um, I think. I think and, and delicious. And delicious. Yeah, it's a great start. I, I usually joke, actually, that this whiskey tastes of burned toast, butter, and marmalade. So this one, if you wake up in the morning and it's a type of lockdown day where you just need a breakfast whiskey, this is the one. Okay, do not launch into something else that might send your day in a very different direction. Whereas this one, you could still you could still survive um, and and have a useful day after having this as a breakfast biscuit. I think. Yeah, great, lovely finish. That's, that's good. <laughs> so yeah, for those of you like I say who are used to drinking single malts, this will be unusual. But for people who used to drink in rums or bourbons as well, if you think of bourbon, they've got corn base and um, American oak. So that's what's happening here. But it's just a little bit more elegantly done because the casks are used uh, and the corn is um, is distilled in a very, to give gentle flavours. OK, so, yeah, getting that citrus coming through as well. So just we're not tasting it tonight, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, but the bottle on the right hand side, um, which is this its brother, that's Nika Coffee Malt. And as the label implies, it's distilled in the coffee still as well. So it is technically also a grain whiskey, because remember I said a single malt has to be distilled in a pot still. So if you see the word coffee on it, it means it can't be a single malt. Um, But it's made from 100% malted barley, which is super unusual. Like I said before, you wouldn't. You've got to be crazy if you're going to use a a malted barley base for your uh, grain whiskey, because grain whiskey is supposed to be cheap and your malted barley is expensive. But in Japan, as Nathan explained earlier, Takitsuru is playing around with whatever he's got to hand using whatever equipment he's also got to hand. So this was another way of making a different flavoured style of whiskey. And the coffee malts tastes of Maltesers, uh, malted milk, uh, those kind of things, uh, which will hopefully help us leading into whiskey number two. Indeed. You've had to listen to us for, you know, 30, 40 minutes before we've given you any whiskey. And now it's like whiskey. We're whiskey. smashing through the shots. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. So, yeah, whiskey number two. Uh, if you guys want to pour it out into the glass or if you're more organized than me, you've probably got your six glasses set up. Um, so this is Nika Days. So Nika Days was released in 2018. So it was just over two years ago. And the idea with this was to create an easy, approachable blended whiskey, something that would be a really nice entry point into not only Nika, but to Japanese whiskey and whiskey in general. Now, I don't know about anyone else, but when I first started kind of my foray into the whiskey world, it was terrifying. I mean, it's a lot of Scottish words that you can't pronounce. The flavors in there, you've got things, people describe things like tarry rope and, you know, burnt tires. I'm like, I don't want any Hospitals, like, hospitals. My dad trying to give me Lefroy 10 when I'm six years old. And I'm yeah, like, drink <laughs> this, it tastes like bleach. Like, <laughs> Why would you do this? You're just trying to put me off. Yeah. <laughs> so Nika Days is meant to be that really nice jumping off point for people that are just trying to get into whiskey for the first time or for people that really love whiskey and are just looking for a bit more of a laid back spirit. So the makeup of Nika Days, it's predominantly whiskey number one. So the coffee grain. So a good chunk of this is going to be the coffee grain. But when you're building a blend, the key thing is adding complexity, but also keeping it elegant and blending everything together. So a traditional blend like this would have a large proportion of grain whiskey. And then we use the single malts like seasonings, just like with your steak. So you add a little bit of salt, pepper, thyme, garlic, lots of butter to your steak. We're looking to have a large amount of grain whiskey that we then add complexity, depth, and elegance with our single malts. So Nika coffee, de- Nika coffee grain is the main component here. And then we have a little bit of a single malt called Miyagi Kyo. Then we add a little bit of the coffee malt whiskey, and then a teeny tiny touch of Yoichi. And that's going to give you the smoke that kind of binds everything together and wraps it up in a nice little package. So Nika Days is 40% ABV. Uh, it is going to be slightly younger whiskies than sort of the 12 year old coffee grain and things like that. But the idea here is freshness. We're looking for that really approachable, fresh, zesty nose. You want it to kind of jump off the palate. And the idea with this, too, if you want to drink like, um, you know, like they do in Japan, 
a high ball or a Mizuari is absolutely perfect with this. So a good slug of Nika Days, and then top it up with either soda water for a high ball, or top it up with water, and you've got yourself a Mizuari. So it's really, really elegant, and it's kind of floral, fruity, springtime, good 11s is whiskey, like Steph said. But you can also <laughs> go sort of aperitif whiskey as well. And if anyone's feeling a bit adventurous, whiskey and tonic with this one is really, really tasty. Now You're I knew crazy. someone the first time they told me that. You're crazy. I'm still, I'm still no. I've not tried a bit no. Um, but maybe I, I should trust you. You're the one who knows. Um, but I also think this one, like showing the blending, because we just tasted one component of this, and then all the extra layers of flavor in this compared to the one we just tasted, which was pretty complex in the first place, is just amazing. I think and really helps anyone who doesn't understand what blending is about, this is a great example. 100%. And I think when you when you look at, you know, the blends and, and the types of blends that we have as entry-level blends in the UK, and this is nothing against your Bells and your Grants and things like that, they are amazingly consistent, really well-priced products. But the, the skill of using that super inefficient 200-year-old coffee still to create distillate of this quality it's something that no one does anymore. There's very few coffee stills that are still out there working. I can think of maybe one in Scotland, and that's at Loch Lomond. Um, there's certainly even fewer in Japan. I'm, I'm sure there are coffee stills. I know in the rum world, Steph, there's a few coffee stills knocking about. <laughs> but uh, inefficiency in distillation gives you flavor. It's why we still use pot stills. The people who also quite often buy coffee stills are the people who can't afford a big fancy modern column still with computers. So, you know, you're a little rum distillery in the Caribbean and you're like, well, I'd like a column still, but these are dead expensive. Oh, has anyone got a second hand? Oh, I'll, I'll take that second hand one. I feel like Takatsura is in a similar place. Um, I'll take the second hand one, actually. It's also similar to what I, to what I worked on in the first place. Um, also, I don't have computers yet because <laughs> it's the 1960s. So, you know, it was all just, um, I think, a little bit more cost effective. Okay, got Definitely, and, and you know, with the uh, with the coffee still as well, it, it's something that you know, it's Nick is all about tradition, but also innovation. So if they were to take the coffee still out, which is such an integral part of Nika's blends, then you know it would be a very very different end product if we were to use it, and it would also be a massive dishonor to Takatsuru's memory to kind of say, no, you didn't have the right idea. We want a super efficient column still now. He'd be like, no, absolutely not. But I don't mean also, it's almost what you choose to make vodka from. And actually, Nika, funnily enough, are making vodka. But when they're making vodka, they're also using this really inefficient coffee still as well. So uh, they're really sticking to that. That's it. It's a, it's a fantastic product. And I think when we taste the blends, you know, the grain is the thing that I always, it's the thing that I find most exciting about it because it's, it's the backbone and it's the biggest component. And the single malts are great. And we will taste those on their own. And in the next whiskey we taste, we'll obviously taste just single malts. But the grain, I think, is the glue that binds Nika together. And a lot of people, a lot of distilleries, won't ever talk that much about their grain whiskey. Nika released this in 2014 because they were like, oh, my God, how good is our grain whiskey? We should release this and let people try it. And then that follows a lot of other unnamed distilleries releasing grain whiskey um, in Japan. But <laughs> it's a nice kind of different point for Nika. And it's coffee grain goes into every single one of the, the blended whiskeys that isn't a pure malt. So it's a really important starting point. And then we've done Nika Days. And I think now we're ready for whiskey number three. Excellent. We're so whiskey number three. Tasting comments coming in here, just FYI. Um, so uh, people are really enjoying this. And I think, again, there is a lot. People look at this label and it is bright and it is, um, I don't know, if it reminds me of spring or summer. Um, youthful looking and, and different and playful. And I think a lot of people will just maybe not take the liquid that seriously because of that. And so um, I think some people are, are quite appreciating that, that the liquid is, is amazing. And like I say, leading on from the coffee grain into this one um, really helps you understand all the complexity that's happening. So, yeah, good work, Nathan. Oh, a new one. <laughs> so, yeah, we're now on to super exciting new Takatsuru. So this is the, I'm not sure if anyone, everyone's seen the brand new bottling. Um, so this is the, the brand new, I'm mirrored, so I keep moving it wrong. So this is the brand new Takatsuru non-age statement release. Now, some of you might have seen the older release, which was a black label uh, with gold kanji on the front. That's been discontinued. And this is the whiskey that we've, uh, that's been re it's replacing it. So the Takatsuru range was brought out in honor of Takatsuru by his adopted son Takeshi, who took over the blending when Takatsuru passed away. Um, so to put 
the father of Japanese whiskey's name on the front of the bottle and say, here is what he would have blended, is a pretty bold statement. Luckily, the whiskies are delicious. So the Takatsuri range is, it's a type of whiskey that's called something different in Scotland. So in Scotland, we call this a blended malt, or it used to be called a vatted malt. In Japan, they call it a pure malt. So this just means it is a blended whiskey, but it's blended from only single malts. And I've had the question 100,000 times, people go, why on earth would you blend something that's already good with something that's already good? Why would you blend two things that are fine together? And my answer when I'm talking about Japanese whiskey is always sushi. Rice is delicious on its own. Fish is delicious on its own. When you put those two things together, you get flavors that you can't get just from the fish and you can't get just from the rice. So this is what the idea of the, the kind of the pure malt is. You're enhancing flavors from Miyagi Kyo and you're enhancing flavors from Yoichi and you're making them do things that you can't do in the single malts on their own. So the way that this is kind of made up, it's predominantly Miyagi Kyo, which is a light, fruity, Speyside style whiskey, which we are going to taste later. But there is a much higher component part in this whiskey that is the Yoichi than in previous releases. Now, the reason they've done this is to kind of hark back to how Takatsu would have blended whiskey in Scotland and the styles of blended whiskey. Whiskies were a lot more robust back in the early 1900s than they are today. There's inefficiencies in distillation. Obviously, all these computers have come in now to make things hyper efficient. This is kind of telling everyone to take a little step back, have a relax and enjoy something that was a little bit older, something a bit more from the past. So, I mean, myself and Steph have only really tried this in the last month, I think. We got it into the UK. We, yeah, we sneaked over a couple of samples just before it arrived. So it only arrived like a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we managed to get some samples just so that we could actually plan, plan these tastings, for example, and know what we were doing. And, um, and yeah, it's been super interesting because obviously we've known the Takitsuri range for a little while. There was originally in the old days when I started working with the brand, there was a 12, a 17, mm -hmm. one, a 25. Then they discontinued a 12 and replaced that with a no age statement. Then they've discontinued all the age statements and now discontinued the no age statement and replaced it with a new no age statement. So it's just been so much happening. The main thing I think, um, and someone's sort of saying they're getting some quite strong flavors on the nose is this has got no grain in it. Okay. This is a hundred percent malts. And so it is going to have a lot more intensity on the, on the nose, on the palate. Um, it's 43% ABV. So it's still stronger than the first one, uh, sorry, weaker in alcohol than the first one, but it's going to taste tons stronger than the first one because it's all pot stilled. And again, if anyone's bored of people like me going on about pot versus column still, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it does have a huge impact on the flavor, which is why we do it all the time, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, you should be getting tons richness, tons more richness from this. Um, Nathan just said earlier, all those Miyagi Kyo flavors, fruity, floral, herbaceous, and then the Yoichi notes coming through. Uh, with that smoky, salty, um, kind of uh, seasidey, oily kind of action. So, yeah, lots going on here. And I think we should definitely take a little bit of time yeah. to get to know it because it is new. Yeah, it, it's super citrusy straight on the nose. And then you're kind of getting all of that, you know, almost kind of like it's not quite an Isla. It's more of a Campbellton style, I feel, when you've got this one. You've got that richness and that oiliness and that it, it tastes old. It tastes like it's from another time. That's yeah. the, the best way to go kind of over attack. Remember, we, we went to Talisker, remember that? Oh, no, we went to Oban. Uh, remember those, um, mm. the sort of smell on, on the front at Oban? Um, like old Scottish town, people with log fires, et cetera, et cetera. Musty carpet. Yeah. <laughs> Fishing town. Yeah. <laughs> Pub quiz. <laughs> Just in case anyone doesn't know, but Nathan and myself uh, and someone else went to uh, Oban after a whiskey show in Scotland and uh, we were in a pub playing Trivial Pursuit and then they started a pub quiz which we did at the same time and we won the pub quiz at the same time as playing Trivial Pursuit. Do you remember that? That was, uh, I do remember that. that was we were quite tipsy and, and very delighted. <laughs> very pleased with ourselves. <laughs> yeah, trying to spend a £50 bar tab like in on Oban on single malt scotches you're like yeah can i get five five doubles they're like that's three pound fifty <laughs> no i need to spend oh, all this money <laughs> so yeah the right, so was slightly more <laughs> hungover than we should have been yeah all right so got some good tasting notes people are getting yes pear was a great one that nathan and i picked out um when we first tasted this we sat and talked a lot about different varieties of pear tarts didn't we <laughs> we were like hold on which, mm -hmm. which 
with the pair of tarts is this. Um, obviously, there's a bit more smokiness in the last one, a bit more texture. Um, and yeah, again, fruity, the fruity kind of raisin, dried fruits, again, uh, baked fruit kind of jam. Jam is um, also uh, a thing. Yeah, and it's very different from the days. Another, so we've done three styles of whiskey in three whiskeys, a grain, a blend and a blended malt, um, and all are completely different. Um, yeah, licorice, really good taste in those guys. If anyone did taste the old Takatsura as well and is kind of wondering what the main difference is, um, like we said, the main difference is that they've upped the Yoichi content in this one to make it a bit more, uh, a bit more like Takatsura would have had back in early Scotland in the early 1900s. And that means that obviously the sherry cask component, which would have come a lot from the Miyagi Kyo, is slightly less. So whereas the old black label had a lot more of this rich, fruity sherry note, this is a bit more robust and a bit more spicy. So two savory. very different styles of whiskey. It's a bit more savory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So that um, extra Yoichi is just kind of, you know, added a bit more smoke, a bit more power to what was quite a delicate whiskey before. Well, a bit more rustic as well. When you're thinking about old school style distilleries versus modern whiskeys, it does seem a bit more, I don't know, it's got a bit more, uh, is it heart to it? I don't know what the word is, but it, it just, yeah. it's got that kind of rustic rich. All the flavors are really, really mixed together. Whereas Japanese whiskeys are quite often quite precise. And quite structured, whereas this one feels a bit more integrated, a bit yeah. more. I don't know what the word is, but it's it's kind of rustic, slightly less precise, a bit more grayed areas. It's, it's not as clean, and that's a that's a much nicer way of saying like you know when I taste Springbank, I'm always like it tastes dirty, but in the best way. It tastes yeah. like Springbank. It tastes like Victorian engineering. I, I was trying not to say that, but good work. yeah, but it, it has that kind of element to it like it's obviously japanese and blended to a, a certain degree of precision but there is a bit more it's a bit more rough around the edges kind of bits yeah to this one. absolutely yeah it's a bit more there's coal there is you know those kind of things so yeah i think it's 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 slightly less soft times it's a little bit more um, less polished. yeah definitely polish is the word well good yeah we're still making up all the words to go with it but um Really lovely to taste. And I think, again, after days, hopefully everyone's noticing the differences in texture because uh, of the lack of grain there. So, yeah, exactly. You're getting, um, yeah. Yeah, good. Where are we going now, Nathan? I've forgotten what we're doing now. now to to Miyagi Kyo now. So, yeah, we're just. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. So just while you're sipping this, I'm going to tell you, we're going to move back into history. So we've obviously come, we've come forward a little bit from um, the grain whiskey um, shipping over those stills in the early 1960s. And um, Takitsu, remember, he'd been making 600 different types of, of whiskey at Yoichi um, and then made his grain whiskey so he could make blends. And this is all great. He's doing quite well. He's, he's progressing, you know, quite thoroughly with his plan. But there is a slight spanner in the works because Yoichi Distillery, as you saw earlier, is on an island next to the sea. So all of those 600 different types of whiskey that they're making there all taste a little bit coastally or islandy, which is delicious in themselves. But if you're trying to make a blend, you need flavors of whiskey that taste like they've come from a different region. And that's hard to do at one distillery. So Takitsuru decides to build a second distillery for himself. So that again, he can produce many more flavors of single malts so that his blends can be even more rounded and even more complex. So he actually uh, wanders around Japan for two years, tasting rivers like a crazy person. My favorite. I love it. OK. Um, and again, Takitsu, I'm not sure if you sort of mentioned earlier, but he's not really one who cares about logistics or maybe a business plan and is in, you know, got in mind a way to make a huge profit or a hugely successful company. He is all about the whiskey, the liquid. Um, and if he happens to build his first distillery in an island where no one lives and to export from there to the mainland is really difficult, but because it'll taste the way he wants it to taste, he's going to do it. Um, and he does the same with Miyagikyo. So he decides to set this distillery up in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Um, in the north of Japan, uh, inland lots and lots of hills and valleys and a really really kind of hairy drive to be honest tiny tiny little roads i don't know how he expected to be shipping in grain and shipping out whiskey he didn't think about that but he tasted the river and was like this 
this tastes like a river in Scotland. And so we will put the distillery here. And everyone's like, but no, no, this is a dreadful idea. Please don't do this. And so he does it anyway. Okay, so this is, I think, you've got to bear in mind with Takitsuri. And um, yeah, so he, he found the site. It's where two rivers meet. Um, and he also thought it was a bit fate because one of the rivers is called the Nikawa River. And so Nika was the name of the company. Um, and Wa means kind of balance. Uh, so it, this was the second or so to bring balance to his first distillery. So, um, you know, he just loved this whole idea. Beautiful, beautiful valley in the middle of nowhere and nothing else here. So he starts building this distillery in 1969. And um, like I say, the point of this is to make kind of coastal or space ID styles of whiskey uh, because he's got the coastal and islandy style from Yuichi. So that's what he's trying to do here. So if everyone pours um, this next strand, this is number four. And this is a picture of the distillery, the lovely green uh, distillery here. And um, oh yes, it is very amazing on the nose. And um, lots and lots of flavor. So obviously this one should be as sort of as full bodied as the last one because it's still a malt. There's still no grain in this one at all. Um, but you should notice um, that it's a bit more singular in flavor. So it's got a lot more of this green foresty notes, which I think this per picture is perfect. It's got a lot of sherry cask in it, as Nathan just mentioned. So it's got a lot of honey and uh, dried fruits on the nose. Um, and then there is a tiny wee bit of peat in here, but not very much at all. So just like Yuichi, he is making 600 different types of single malts here as well. So he's not using the heavily peated barley like he does at Yuichi. So here it's unpeated, lightly peated and medium. Again, there's loads of different yeast strains, loads of different fermentation times, and loads of different cask types. So we've got all those variables being changed every batch that he makes so that he can make as many different flavors as possible in order to make a blend, all right? So we're getting lots of fruitiness, I think, coming on the nose. Um, honey as well, uh, cooked fruits. So lots and lots happening. Now, when you think about the awards that Japanese single malts have won, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, I think here's a great example of why. You know, your average Scottish distiller, I think Nathan mentioned earlier, is making using one peak level in their barley, using one yeast strain, the same one that they always use, doing maybe one or two fermentation times, actually. They'll sometimes do a longer one at the weekend because they don't want to come in on a Sunday morning and change everything over, but usually it's all around the same fermentation time. And then they'll age everything in ex-bourbon or ex-sherry or a combination. So those are your options. Whereas here, we've got three different peat levels, loads of different yeast strains, hundreds of different fermentation times, and the cask types are, are widely varied as well. Now, it's not as widely varied as we get nowadays. They're not using rum casks or all kinds of other crazy stuff as well. But if you think, they've got quite a lot of options just with American oak. So you've got virgin American oak, make a brand new cask yourself. Then you have an ex-bourbon cask, so one that's freshly used, first fill from America, having been used for American whiskey. Then you have a refill cask. That's either of those first two that's been used once for Japanese whiskey, and then they'll use it again. Then they have a remade cask. That's a cask you've used a couple of times. Take the top and the bottom off, replace that with new wood, but leave the staves as old. And then you've also got a recharred cask, a cask you've used a few times. Shave off the inside, char it, so you've got fresh char on old wood. All right, that's just American oak. Then you've also got Oloroso casks and Pedro Jimenez casks as well. And when we were there, we saw them charring an Oloroso cask, which, as far as we knew, wasn't part of the options, but they seem to be doing it. So maybe it is, okay? So there's a lot of options here, just with a couple of different cast types that you can have completely different flavors in the whiskey coming through. So you add all this together and you could, because it's a single malt, the word single means made at one distillery. It doesn't mean one yeast strain. It doesn't mean one peat level, one cask type. So you could in this single malt have all 600 types from Miyagikyo put in there and still call it a single malt. No, it's not all 600 types. That's madness. It's about 100 to 120. But that's still a lot more than you'll get at, say, an average Scotch distillery because they haven't got that many types in the first place. So this is one of the reasons why quite a lot of the Japanese single malts are making, are winning so many awards and, and making such complex whiskies because there's layers of flavor in here. Um, it just keeps evolving and keeps changing. So lots and lots and lots happening. Yeah, and it's a great distillery. I'm not sure if anyone's ever heard me do this before, but there's a bit of a trick to saying it. Luckily, none of you are having to ask me questions. You're all typing if you need to. Um, but just in case, uh, the kyo at the end of Miyagi Kyo 
in Japanese means valley. And so if this distillery was in Scotland, this distillery would be called Glen Miyagi, okay? Because Glen also means valley. And then this is the Miyagi Valley, the Miyagi territory in the Sendai province. Um, so if, you've, if you're not sure how to pronounce it, just try and remember Karate Kids, okay? Mr. Miyagi, um, so Miyagi Kyo. And Miyagi actually means sort of holy temple. Uh, there's a whole bunch of history. And actually Mr. Miyagi was not from here, unfortunately. There's another Miyagi Kyo in the south of Japan, in Okinawa, uh, which I have been to. Uh, and I was very excited. But it, this is where okay, uh, Mr. Miyagi is from and not here. All right, just in case. So, yeah, some great, great. Oh, more tasting notes happening. A little bit of tobacco coming through. Yeah. yeah, ginger. Yeah, really good tasting note. Lots of bananas coming through. We're getting the toast again. Um, and hessian. Yes. So that herbaceous foresty note is uh, really good. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I always think whenever I taste Miyagi Kyo, it's it's one of those things where you see that picture, that's what Miyagi Kyo tastes like. It is the the kind of damp forest floor from the sherry note, the kind of stewed fruits. It's green, it's grassy. It's it's always, I always want to love Yoichi more, but I keep coming back to Miyagi Kyo and I'm like, no, this is the one. It's it, springtime in a glass, but you can drink it anytime as well. I'm the same. This just blows my mind every time. And I'm, I'm a peaty girl. So for me, Yoichi is the obvious one to love. Um, I love all, everything coastal, everything smoky. And so, you know, on paper, you eat your favorite. I'm not saying it's worse. It's just that I expect to love it and I do. Whereas me, Gikyo, some space sites, are just, they feel a bit watery to me um, or a bit imbalanced. And then this is just so, so rich and thick and just got so, so much happening. Um, the other thing that's quite interesting about it, if anyone wants to geek out and stills a little bit, I know I did mention some earlier, is that Miyagikyo has really tall stills um, and they actually have a great diagram here um, and the one on the right is Miyagikyo so they've got a little kind of bubble in the neck and an ascending line arm which is creating this really aromatic light elegant spirit that you're all feeling and I'm not sure if anyone's got any left but if you take a sip and the flavor hits your mouth and then it kind of explodes up into the sky like fireworks and I do sound like a crazy person right now, but when um, when we taste the next whiskey, which uses stills that are the opposite shape, basically, we'll notice that that whiskey points down, okay? Whereas this whiskey points up when you sip it. And I think that is a big thing that people don't understand quite often about the shape of stills and the effect that they have on the texture of the spirit. People will talk about flavors a lot, but texture is actually, I think, more important sometimes, okay? So yeah, lots and lots happening in this one, but it is still got that light, elegant, aromatic kind of thing happening. That's because of the shape of the still here. Um, so yeah, our people loving the Karate Kid reference. You've got to get got to get Karate Kid into a tasting, otherwise, if you, I mean, if you go to any other whiskey tastings, guys, you just need to make sure you're like, sorry, you've not mentioned Karate Kid. What are you doing? <laughs> Especially <laughs> Japanese whiskey. Like, come on, what this is where it's from? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's worth knowing as well. This is a non-age statement too. So we're we're actually really fortunate that Nika had the foresight to to stop doing age statements back in 2015, because otherwise we probably wouldn't be drinking single malts and we'd have far fewer blends. But whenever we you speak to the chief blender at Nika, it's a guy called Tadashi Sakuma. Um, he's saying that kind of the age statements, they were delicious whiskies, but it kind of puts you in a box a little bit because you know a 10-year-old Miyagi Kyo. The youngest whiskey going in has to be 10 years old. But what happens if you've got five or six absolutely superb sherry casks sitting there at five years old that are just desperate to be put into a single malt? They couldn't do it. So now the single malts being non-age statement means that we can utilize and Nika can blend a lot more of the, the different and weird casks to create this amazing complexity throughout it all. So the Yoichi is very, very similar in terms of the age on this. And we say the lion's share is around about the sort of 10 year mark. There will be some younger whiskey and there will be some older whiskey in there as well. I think it's pretty amazing though as well, because obviously in the old days there was the age statements and there was those no age statements uh, whiskeys. And this, I think one of the only times in history that they discontinued the old Miyagikyo no age statement, which was eight to 10 years old, to replace it with an older <laughs> no age statement whiskey. Um, which is obviously the opposite way that most people go. Most people are, are trying to discontinue older things to replace them with younger things. And these guys, they were like, no, no, we're blending everything that used to go into the old no age statement, the 10, 12 and 15 together to make this new no age statement. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. That's a, have you seen Cobra Kai, Nathan? 
I have not. I need to watch it. I have it. not seen Cobra Kai, no. Yeah, I'm excited to watch it. But, um, I haven't started yet. I'm trying to finish. Oh, I'm finishing. <laughs> um, anyway, we should not get into that. Um, right. Yes, age statements. Yes, people are people are 100% right. Age statements. They, they were useful in the old days when communicating things about whiskey was really difficult because all you could do it was on the label. So you could just write a big number and that would be enough. But nowadays we have the internet. We have have zoom or whatever this is um so we're able to talk about what makes uh, things taste the way they do rather than just relying on a number which is quite good um, I think the, the quality of distillates massively improved as well and in terms of you know an age statement back in the 1960s was like oh it spent enough time in a cask to not be minging you know it's like the quality of the distillate wasn't always good so younger whiskey wasn't necessarily going to be a good idea so like a 15 year old you're like okay it's enough woody flavor to mask that spirit Whereas now everyone's distilling pretty incredible liquid. I mean, I can drink most new make straight off the still. I'm like, this is delicious. Just give it to me in a bottle now. But um, no, it's uh, everything. Quality in whiskey is going up massively. And it has in the last 10 years. So it's only going to uh, get better as well. That's science, isn't it? Science. Exactly. <laughs> so shall we move on to whiskey number five? Let's do it. Cool. So whiskey number four, Miyagi Kyo. Like we said, that's... Uh, Nika's second single malt distillery, and we're going to go back in time to 1934, to kind of what we started with at Nika, and we're going to go to Yoichi. So the idea with having the two distilleries was that you not only had two different locations to produce your hundreds of different distillates, you also had very, very different styles of whiskey being produced at the two distilleries. So whereas Miyagi Kyo was meant to be quite modern, it had bigger shaped pot stills, it had uh, much more efficient ways of distilling using mostly sherry casks. Yoichi is very much stuck in the early 1900s and it's done that through choice. So a lot of the, the choices that are made when making Yoichi, those are the choices that you know would have been made in the early 1900s and have been phased out in Scotland. So from still shape and size to distillation technique, there's some very, very kind of unique things which are, as far as I know, unique in the whiskey world to making Yoichi. Now, Steph mentioned very briefly the pot stills and, you know, being whiskey ambassadors, pot stills are kind of what we end up talking about quite a lot and we all get very excited about them. So the shape of the still at Yoichi is what's going to give the main mark difference in the type of distillate. So I always like to think of pot stills as, as kind of like an obstacle course for the spirit. So the harder you make that obstacle course, the lighter the spirit is going to be at the end. Just like us in exercise, the harder we work, the more calories we burn, the lighter we become, in theory. No. <laughs> <laughs> so at uh, Miyagi Kyo, like Steph said, you've got this kind of boil ball in the middle. You've got a much kind of um, thinner neck. And you've got an ascending lineup. So the spirit has to struggle a lot more to get out. And every time it touches the copper, it's going to recondense. And all of those kind of heavy molecules are going to split into lighter and fruitier ones. At Miyagi Kyo, that is designed to be that way and give us a lighter spirit. At Yoichi, it's all about creating a rich, oily, quite traditional, quite coastal spirit. So we've got a much wider opening in the neck. It's a much shorter pot still. And it's a descending line arm. And it also uses a condenser called a worm tub, which is, you know, if you see a picture of what a still in a worm tub looks like, it's not really changed since the Persians were distilling rose oil 3,000 years ago. It's pretty archaic. But this inefficiency leads to kind of rich, bold flavor. But Yoichi go one step further as well. And they've actually got the last kind of vestige of the coal-fired stills, direct coal-fired pot stills. Now, this is ridiculous because this is something that should have stopped in the 1930s when thermostats and gas heating was invented. Now, if, if anyone's cold right now in the house and they want to turn the heating up, you go to your thermostat and you can crank it up by 0.5 degrees. It's fairly precise. If anyone's got a coal fire heating in the house, I know Steph's got a log burning fire, there's not much you can do. You can add some coal and you can take some coal away. So this is a highly inefficient way of distilling because it's so hard to regulate the temperature. I have two things that let air in that I don't know what they do. <laughs> yeah, more, more air hot. But I'm still not, I know, I don't know. <laughs> so distillation is an incredibly precise part of whiskey making. Like ethanol 
evaporates at 78.3 degrees Celsius. Now, if you want to distill very efficiently and concentrate light flavors, it's good to try and keep your still at a temperature between 78.3 and say 96 degrees Celsius. And that way you can make sure that you only get the good bits. The coal fired stills at Yoichi run anywhere from 800 to 1300 degrees Celsius. So this is incredibly difficult to get efficiency, but they managed to do it. So that very quick distillation means that the spirit isn't spending much time in the still at all. It's a very, very quick condensation. And then you're ending up with all of these big, rich, oily flavors in the glass. So Yoichi also uses heavily peated barley and all of that gives us that kind of maritime coastal peaty, smoky, bonfire, toasty flavor that is so unique to Yoichi. This, when I first tried it, I didn't understand how a whiskey could taste like this. And I've only tasted whiskey with this sort of texture back from kind of like, you know, it's going to sound like a humble brag here, but 60s Beaumont, 50s Art Bags, things like that. And the reason why they taste that way is because all of these distilleries were using coal-fired stills at this time. So the last Scottish distillery to stop this was Glendronic in 2006. This is something that doesn't exist in Scotland anymore, but it's something which gave a huge amount of flavor. The reason it stopped is because you've got to fire some thin metal and then volatile compounds, so basically a bomb. So this is not the safest way to distill, but it adds a huge amount of uh, or uniqueness to, to Nika's whiskies. I mean, none of the accidents at all distilleries were from the coal, were they? It was always the mill. <laughs> always like, oh, the flour in the mill again. Oops. Uh, we've burnt that bit down. Uh, the stills are actually, like, they look dangerous. But I think they're, all... they're really difficult as well. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a bugger. Like, shovel coal and they, they left for lunch when you were doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I shoveled coal in for a, a terrifyingly long time when I was there. And I was just so delighted to get the coal, the full shovel of coal mm. through the door that I just tipped the coal in like two inches into the door. Um, and I made a nice little pile just there at the door. And I was supposed to be throwing the coal into a nice flat bed along, along the bottom, which I had not done. So apparently that had made the flavor different. I had made a special, a special distillate that day, which they probably threw away. Um, <laughs> I was like, just put it in a cask. I'll have it. It's all right. Um, I think it's such a good description, Nathan. Like I've got this log burning fire here. And you know, if I was trying to boil a kettle, and you know hit have a thermometer in that kettle and hit a specific temperature i just wouldn't be able to do it um it's just not a chance um i just have to keep keep tipping in cold water which isn't isn't an option in this still uh, to try and get there so yeah we're getting some good flavor tasting notes here so yeah people are saying that there is a lot of peat or coal kind of in the flavor but it's also really gentle i think this is the thing this is not like an isla whiskey you're not going to get that huge hit of peat um in, in Japan, they, they don't really like uh, intensely flavoured things, particularly intensely flavoured smoky things. Everything needs to be well balanced um, and and elegant and, and structured. So um, I think the smoke on this, I would say, is a much more sort of polite almost. Sometimes Scottish whiskies, that's all they've got. They're just they're yelling at you with all the smoke from across the road, and it's a little bit scary. Whereas this is is, is gentle. Um, and I think if you've got friends who don't like smoky whiskey, but you'd like them to get into it, this is a really good one to, to get them into it because it's not got that terrifying nose. Um, it's just uh, warming and nice. And this is about as peaty as you can get in Japan. Like, There's no releases that are readily available that are more peaty than this. So this is just kind of to show the, the, scape, the scope of the flavor. It's not anything that's going to be you know, a big slap in the face with TCP or iodine and stuff like that. It doesn't matter how you know much peat or how heavy the peat the ppm is in this the japanese blenders are always going to make something super precise and super elegant and well balanced and my my favorite way to describe like japanese whiskies is integrated there's never huge flavor jumps or huge flavor spikes everything is perfectly in balance so i just kind of think of you know when we're tasting some scotches especially in single casks and stuff you're kind of going Big flavor spike, or big flavor spike like this, or like a heart rate monitor. In Japanese whiskey, it's almost a vertical building of, uh, of whiskeys going on top of each other. And every time you go back, you get something slightly different. Um, that is a good way of thinking about it. Because, you know, I've, so like a Mexican culture and the way they think about time is very different from how we think we think of time as linear and they think of time as circular. I think that's a really interesting way of thinking of flavor as well. I'm going to need to think about that for a second. Donna's just asked a great question though. Uh, where does Nika from the barrel fit into this? 
a very, very good question. I mean, we're going to taste, the last whiskey is kind of the, the older sibling of Nika from the Barrel. Uh, but Nika from the Barrel is, it's kind of Nika's flagship blended whiskey. So it's made up in a similar way to Days, uh, but we take away the coffee malt aspect. So it's still predominantly Nika coffee grain, around 60%. And then the other 40% is made up of a blend of Yoichi and Miyagi Kyo. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, so what's the ratio of Yoichi and Miyagi Kyo? And it changes every single time. Because unfortunately, with blending, you're never going to be able to make the exact same whiskey because every cask of whiskey is going to be different. So the goal of the blenders is to trick the end consumer into thinking they're drinking the same whiskey by mixing up the recipes and trying to find a very similar flavor profile. So this is actually a really good thing to, to think about now because we're going to tell, talk about Taylor, which is all about the blending. So 60% coffee grain and then 40% of the malts, they're aged for on average 10 years. And then they're selected by our um, chief blender, who is Tadashi Sakuma. And I've got a very happy picture of him here. He looks enthralled in what he's doing here. Um, so he chooses the recipe for the blend. That gets shipped to Nika's blending plant. And then that gets batted together. It's diluted down to 51.4%, which is the old 90 proof, 90 imperial proof. And then this is where the from the barrel bit comes in. So once it's been blended and diluted to 51.4, it goes back into barrels for three to six months um, to allow the flavors to marry a little bit. So if you think about a blended whiskey, it's not just, you know, a whiskey from here, a whiskey from here, and a whiskey from here. It's hundreds sometimes of different casks being thrown together, each one with a very different chemical composition, different viscosities, different flavors. You need all of those things to, to sit together for a little bit to get to know each other. So that's what that extra marrying process at the end is doing. And the Nika from the barrel at a slightly higher ABV, the reason they did that is because the, the chief blenders at Nika wanted to, you know, back in the 80s when this came out, Japanese whiskey wasn't a very big thing over here. And in Japan, most of the whiskeys that were sold were, you know, for blending. They were for mixing. They were for highballs, for Mizuaris. And Nika wanted to bring out a whiskey that showed the quality of Japanese whiskey and showed the, the consumer what the blenders got to drink. So the stuff that they got to taste. So higher ABV, more concentrated malts, a little bit less on the grain. And that's where Nika from the barrels come from. So to this day, it's still, I believe, the best selling Japanese whiskey in Europe. It's the whiskey that got me into Japanese whiskey. And it's probably the one that I drink the most of uh, at home because I think it works neat. It's great with a beer. It's great in cocktails. You can have it, you know, it's really good in barbecue sauce for chicken wings too. So if anyone's in London at any point and goes to bowl in a China shop, then they <laughs> still have that one. Oh, going out. Don't be crazy. Don't be <laughs> crazy. Um, but yeah, so uh, sorry if anyone was looking for that this evening, but because we had these two new ones uh, to taste with you, and this is the first tasting we're doing in the country with them, so uh, quite exciting. Um, then uh, we, we had to sort of uh, miss one out and we thought <laughs> the next one is its big brother, basically. We thought we'd be able to skip Nico from the barrel. Just a couple of other little points, actually, going on some comments. Um, people talking about the peatiness of the Yoichi. And I just wanted to, to say, I don't think we mentioned earlier, that actually there is peat in Japan, and where Takitsuri's situated Yoichi um, was uh, downriver from a peat bog. That was why he chose the, the location. His plan was to make his own peated barley, which um, he did for a little while. He realized he wasn't very good at it and in japan if you're not really good at something you're like nope i will let the experts do this um rather than be a bit shoddy at it and so um after the war uh, all the peated barley that nika are using is coming from scottish malt houses so it will be scottish or, or northern european at the very least uh, peat and barley for those peaty bits they do grow a wee bit of barley in japan and malt their own barley for some of the unpeated sections but it's a really, really minor component because it's also used in in other other making other things in Japan as well. So it's pretty hard to get a hold of. Um, and the pure malt black and the pure malt white are not around. No, they are discontinued. Um, they were discontinued a couple of years ago. We in the UK managed to buy the rest of the stock from Europe, and we've kind of kept them going for a little while. The red is still in that position. Red is discontinued. Uh, pure malt red. Uh, we still have some stock, not loads. Um, and so if you, you know, if you want to collect a, a discontinued Japanese whiskey, then the tackets, the old tackets here with the black label and the gold writing is one or the pure malt red would be your other one to look out for. Definitely. And the Nika 12, which is still in a couple uh, yes. of shops as well. 
the Nika 12, which this one has essentially replaced. So am I talking, you're talking about this one, aren't you? Yeah, I'll, I'll do Taylor. I'm not so, yeah, drink this. <laughs> this, this brings on to our final whiskey, which is, like I said, the the older sibling. Um, I don't want to say the more refined sibling, but it's definitely, Nika view this and they put this on a bit more of a pedestal. And this is kind of part of the premium range, which is why it's called the Nika, not just Nika from the barrel. So this is the Nika tailored. Um, Look at that bottle. This, it's a chunky bottle, yeah, right? Yeah, so I've got the bottle here. So it's a big, <laughs> chunky, probably a good bar fight bottle, to be honest. Um, shouldn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is a direct replacement for the Nika 12. And you know, it's obvious why the Nika 12 got discontinued. It's because the stocks were running low because of the, the success of Japanese whiskey. So silver lining is that Nika is doing really, really well and that they are building up more stocks. But if we want to have all of these shiny new whiskies to drink, we have to take age statements off. So the Nika 12 follows the same sort of recipe um, as the Nika tailored. So we've got instead of it being 60% grain and 40% malt, like Nika from the barrel, it's around about 60% malt and 40% grain. So by starting with a higher malt percentage, you're already starting with more complexity, more of that kind of big, bold flavor, um, and then a little bit less of that elegant style that you'd find from the grain. So you're starting with a super complex whiskey. So you've got the Yoichi and the Miyagi Kyo kind of intermingling. And then you've got the grain whiskey, which kind of ties everything together and brings the, the smoky elements of Yoichi into counterbalance with the light and the fruity parts of the Miyagi Kyo. So it's 43% ABV. And it's also the age statement on this. Obviously, there is no age statement, but the lion's share is still going to be between sort of 10 and 12 years. But there's just allowing themselves to put a little bit more younger whiskey in if they want to. And there'll also be a bit more of the older stuff in, but maybe not quite as old as Nika 12 was. That was between 12 and 25 years. The branding is very similar as well. Um, they've kind of taken it out of the blue and the gold and made it a bit more streamlined, a bit more slick. Um, Naoki and Amiko, who are the two reps from Nika that we deal with quite a lot, they were very, very proud of this one because they kind of modeled it a bit on Savile Row and that kind of very elegant James Bond kind of thing. So they're looking at this very, very precise, very dapper, Kind of bottle um, but the whiskey inside it, it's fantastic and i think when you're talking about blends not many people are blending this way anymore so taking a larger percentage of malt and then putting a little bit of grain in the grain is just there to kind of tie all those bits together but the malt is the real player in this one and again obviously we're comparing this to nika days from earlier which is predominantly grain going here at the end to something predominantly malt it's a huge huge difference um and also, I think this, you know, it's blended to have a bit more of a similar flavor profile to the Nika from the Barrel, this one, which is a bit more wintry. It's a bit less floral. It's a bit more rich and dark, whereas the Nika Days has got all those light springtime kind of uh, flavors in it, all that citrus. And this is definitely uh, a much more autumny, wintry kind of action. See so, yeah, people get apricot, uh, which I think apricot, honey. Uh, pastry, yeah, absolutely perfect. Yeah, stone fruits, kind of like cobbler, that kind of thing. So you've got a buttery note coming in from the grain, but then because you have that, the higher percentage of the malt in there, that's kind of, you know, the Oichi gave you the, the citrusy note, and then you've got the Miyagi Kyo, which is always kind of a, the Christmas pudding, Christmas cake kind of thing, all thrown together in with the buttery. It's just a really, really well-balanced whiskey. Um, and I, I've done side by side with the 12. They're not a million miles away from each other, to be completely honest. Um, Amika was saying, wasn't she, recently, like she was amazed. Obviously, the blenders have been given a task of replace the 12-year-old with, you know, something else. It can't have an age statement. Um, it, we'd like it to be quite similar, please. <laughs> you know, that's a difficult thing. And as Nathan was saying about being a blender, it's, it, it, you know, you're using different things every time, anyway, every batch. To then create something with the layers of flavor that has the, the texture of something old, the texture of those aged whiskeys in there, with a combination of some older whiskies and some younger whiskies in here. Um, they've done a lot of incredible, it is, it's alchemy, it's, it's magic. It's not just blending. That's why they call it an art. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff happening. Um, I also think you'd never in a lineup usually put a blend after a single malt like Yoichi. Yeah, you usually, this is lower ABV. It's younger at the same age. Um, and it's got grain whiskey in it. It's got less flavor. Usually in a tasting, you'd go for things that have more flavor, uh, more intensity. And so I remember the first time I tasted the 12, 
and the master blender Sukuma Sanu we saw earlier had put the the Nika 12 after the Oichi and I was like oh god what's he doing what an idiot <laughs> forgetting that I was thinking about the Nika uh you know chief blender and here again this one completely stands up after such a rich full-bodied complex powerful single more like Yuichi and it's got grain in it and it's a lower ABV um and it it, it shouldn't work but it does I think it's the really nice thing about Anika tasting like this for, for us to do, but also for, for people to kind of to go through is that you you come full circle and you see how every component of Nika fits together. Because if you'd never seen Nika before or you'd never tasted it, you'd go into the Japanese whiskey part of the shop and you'd see nine different products and be like, where do I start? What What's the coffee grain? Where do they get the beans from? How do we do this? <laughs> So then going from the coffee grain and then seeing how that plays a such a big part in the, the lighter and fruitier blends to then tasting, you know, the, the complexities of the single malts on their own to the malts and then coming back to the blends. This is a really, really interesting part of the Japanese mentality as well. Um, and also it shows how much they focus on the blends. I mean, one thing I always like to do is go, here is a, a Japanese single malt and here's the cap for it. It's a piece of plastic. In Scotland, you wouldn't dream of that. <laughs> Here is a Japanese blended whiskey with a pretty big cork and a really fancy bottle. You know, if you want to look at a competitor, Hibiki is the same. You know, the Yamazaki have a screw cap and the Hibiki has a big, you know, amazing bottle. So this shows that they give a huge amount of stock to their blended whiskies. And this is what they're always striving to do. Everything we tasted up to the blends is almost a building block. And that's how it's seen in Japan. I think also the other thing that I'm getting while I'm just listening is that how much this sticks on the front of the palate. And again, sorry, bear with us while we go on about this, just because it's, you know, my fourth or fifth time tasting this um, and the first time using it in a tasting. So just seeing how it's behaving on the palate while you talk, while you listen. And the way this really sticks at that front one third of the tongue and around your sort of front teeth is a really unusual feeling. And the flavor stays for an awful long time um, and just keeps, sort of cycling through different different waves of flavor. There's uh, lots happening here. Um, someone's talking about the samurai bottles, the- uh, the, the golden gold. The golden gold. Um, that's a blend that doesn't get exported. Now, <laughs> when Japanese whiskey <laughs> get exported, there is sometimes maybe a legal reason for that just in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> okay, so there's still a lot of whiskey, like Nathan was explaining at the beginning in Japan, that's made and says whiskey on it. It doesn't really follow any of the laws for what whiskey needs to be in other countries. Okay, so some of the uh, some <laughs> some of the things that are produced in Japan, both by Nika and Suntory, um, wouldn't be able to be exported to countries that have strict laws about what whiskey is. Uh, so yeah, you can get it at, um, at Tokyo airports. Uh, I think we all bought a few, didn't we, Nathan? Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's a tasty blend. Um, there's nothing wrong with the quality of the whiskey. It just doesn't follow the same rules and regulations that the EU sets on whiskey. You got to remember, Japan is a very very young whiskey country in compare in comparison to the UK and Ireland. So you know, strict laws on Scotch whiskey and Irish whiskey have only really been implemented in the last fifty years. But we've been distilling for seven eight hundred. Japan's been distilling for less than 100 years, but they're already so far ahead of where Scotland and Ireland were after they were distilling for 100 years. So it's going to be an interesting future for Japanese whiskey because I think there is more regulation on the way and people like Nika and Santori are kind of working together to, to give a definition of what Japanese whiskey should be. But there is a lot of whiskey in Japan and it's not a bad thing. It just means that there's unaged spirit going in so a spirit that's of really good quality, it just hasn't seen two years of aging. Um, yeah. But for domestic blends, you don't need super aged single malts. You know, it's for drinking in highballs and mizuaris. Yeah, but there's also the other thing, the problem that they're having, which is, you know, Scotch, cheap Canadian whiskey, whatever, being shipped over Japan, bottled in Japan, and then labelled as Japanese whiskey. So there's a lot of that happening too. So I think, you know, very much, I'm really looking forward to there being some kind of laws about what Japanese whiskey is. I think it's it's going to be amazing when it happens because an amazing event happens just because the two main companies haven't really uh, been friends since the 1930s. Um, but it you know it, it kind of needs to happen, and this is the problem that, that we're getting a lot of right now. So it's um, super interesting. Oh, people are liking this one, which is good. Uh, so 
They're saying number six is their favourite. So, yeah, do we have any favourites? Is uh, If you guys want to post. Yeah, just post the number if you can't post remember. The it's fine. Um, yeah, favourite tonight? Well, I'm I have to the two new ones. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> what's your favourite? This one, this is the last one. 100%. I mean, it'd be interesting, yeah, if everyone puts their comments. I mean, it seems I've seen a few people there just say that number six looks like it could be the winner. I mean, it just really is down my avenue completely in terms of the it's stunning, right? Could you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, someone, Tim, is saying the order we taste them and follows the different times of day we drink them. So, yeah, that's – and, again, mm. you, for our job, putting together a lineup in the order that you put it in is – almost more important than what you taste because the flavor of the thing you've just tasted will affect the flavor of the thing you taste next. And you have yeah. to make sure that um, you're not ruining the thing that you taste next by tasting something big and bold before something quite light. So, um, yeah, but I think, you know, we started off with breakfast whiskey and this is definitely post dinner. Uh, I mean, log fire, if you can make it, guys. I feel very smug. A lot of people from number six. There's a people from number one as well, though, which is... Uh... yeah. We've got a two as well. And then four as well, yeah. Oh. I, it's well, it's like, I love it when people like number one. I'm like, yes, coffee grains. <laughs> yeah, coffee, see, coffee grains is my 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 go-to because I do like a wide berth of, of spirits. My favourite is always always will be tequila, but um, I always like my whiskey and my rum. So coffee grain being very rum-like on the tone gives me the best of both worlds. So that's why I'm just picking multiple favorites with uh, so all order and yeah. <laughs> the favorite cheese. Uh, pretty good, I think, in, uh, in this tasting. Yeah. And it goes with your jumper, darling. Uh, that's why. That's why I got the the pink out. Just change <laughs> the color, right? <laughs> nice. That's perfect. What you mean? <laughs> but the six six is really. I mean, I I know you're saying it's quite similar, but I can't remember having the same enjoyment out of the 12 when I've had it compared to this. So there's definitely something that's a, a, a big enough of a step up. Yeah. To really be I unique. actually think it is the younger whiskey because for me, younger whiskey is vibrancy. It's the um, energy that you get from a younger whiskey. You don't need much of it. You just need a wee drizzle that you mm. wouldn't be allowed to put in the 12 because of its age. But that really lifts everything else. It's like adding citrus to, you know, a tomato sauce or something, just, you know, adding a little bit of zing. Um, yeah. uplift all the other flavors i think that's what happens sometimes and people do get really bogged down in ages less so nowadays luckily um but you know i've tasted old whiskies that taste like ours and i've tasted young whiskies that taste like ours and you know yeah. <laughs> like you can make a horrible whiskey at any age um so yeah we've got some more oh lots of numbers coming through now um nika from the barrel donna sticking to that <laughs> 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 I say, yeah, I agree with that. That's my well, it's, um, it's a main staple, hundred percent. The, the the one that we have fly off the shelf the most is nickel from the barrel. We we have to order that a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, we do go through the Kofi's relatively quick, uh, quite even between both. Um, but nickel from the barrel is 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 still by far one of the ones. We only just sold our last few bottles of Nicola Red and Black, funnily enough. Ah. We did have a last order in a few weeks back before lockdown. We did very well. Yeah. Uh, days. Um, yeah. But uh, Takitsuru blended the super after Rita died in her honour. And it was designed right. to taste like the blends that he was drinking in Scotland when he was in Scotland with her when he met her. So it's a bit more smoky. Um, and it's a bit, it's lovely though. And a very traditional shape of bottles. Yeah. Super still around. What was, the, um, what was the reasoning in sticking at the price point though? Because I, 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 it's weird because in my head, you think if you call something Nicker Super Rare, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, but that's expensive. That's going to be, a, that's yeah. gonna be a, what we're going to market at. And then it was like. It was just <laughs> always its name. Yeah. So the price point hasn't changed since it was launched in the 1960s. Um, but then, and the name hasn't changed either. So it's just. <laughs> like, it's just I mean, in, it used in Japan, to be expensive. Yeah, in yeah. Japan, you were, you were competing with scotch <laughs> all the time. So if you didn't call something super awesome whiskey, like, mm. you know, you weren't going to ever outsell it, which is why you had all these weird shaped bottles coming out in Japan as well. It was to try and entice people into buying something that was domestic rather than buying a Glenfiddich or, a, you know, a Talisker or something like that. So Nika super old rare are all the, the yeah, same yeah. things that people wanted to see on a bottle of whiskey. It's like a cocktail menu that's got raspberries <laughs> or elderflower on it. Exactly. Yeah. 
So it's almost well, like, you know, and I think also that actually that point is is maybe not reported as much as it should have been. But I think actually Japanese whiskey plays a massive part in um, the younger generation getting into whiskey nowadays. Again, because of that marketing strategy, when you have these really fancy, almost apothecary style bottles that look smart, they look luxury. You know, the the the, the sort of the youth of today coming up. You know, these they they will live up to this kind of. I guess the Essex lifestyle and the trader lifestyle where it's this kind of very elite look. Well, that's what Japanese whiskey is about. And I think a lot of people got into whiskey and you get these big bars like Hakusen and stuff stocking huge ranges of it, which I think helps a whole new demographic come into whiskey. So I think they're kind of responsible for that and they don't get enough credit for it. For Definitely. That. When I first started, it's almost six years ago when I started working with Nika, we started importing it. And um, whenever I do a tasting somewhere, they'd be like, firstly, we've never sold out a tasting so quickly. And secondly, We've never had so many young people or so many women book tasting really? kits. And, you know, and then they do, they'd be like, well, maybe everything's changed now. Maybe this is the first month that everything's different. And then the next month they'd be like, nope, we're back to a Scotch whiskey and we're back to the same, you know, the same set of people that we always had at tastings. But just this whole different set of people came out for this Japanese whiskey tasting. We don't know where they came from and we don't know why. How did they find out about this? But it's just it was such a weird thing to sort of see happen. So, I think, I mean, it is that sort of, you know, maybe you're expecting Scotch to be a bit more stuffy, be a bit more traditional, have a bit more rules, everyone everyone know a little bit more because it's yeah. been around so long. Um, so maybe you're a bit more sort of like, oh, well, I won't go there because I'll be embarrassed and I won't know anything. Um, whereas like, oh, Japanese, cool. <laughs> you know. Like, yeah, I mean, we get quite a few people which are, uh, that come into the shop and, you know, most people generally are quite honest about, you know, their – they're what they're shopping for their needs are and some people will be quite open and say well that they're diehard scottish people they don't want to they don't want to venture out of scotch whiskey uh, which is why christmas i think is always the best time because we always recommend buying japanese whiskey as a gift because if you buy it for them as a gift and they haven't spent their own money on it they'll accept it and they'll drink it and then when they have it they're like actually this is actually really really good <laughs> and then they come back in for it thinking oh well yeah i've been i've been you know convinced over um yeah. So it's a great, yes, yeah, always a great gift option. But th I think, you know, those that know, know. So you've yeah. had Japanese, you know. No, absolutely. And just, I think some people are heading off because we have done an hour and a half. And sorry, we've run out. But thank you to everyone who came. Um, it was lovely to see your comments, <laughs> not see your faces. See yeah, your and obviously, faces. Um, thank you guys for giving up your time, uh, your evening to, to talk us through and give us a very uh, thoroughly detailed tasting. Um, and obviously we had six, six samples today, which is great because normally we only give four. So... It's a good little we didn't know that. That's joined us today as well, guys. Um, tastings that we have coming up. Um, we haven't got another whiskey one booked at the moment. The next couple are, are gin, so I'll, I'll post some um, links on here for the next couple of tastings that we have got coming up. Um, Whiskey-wise, because we're going to go into the Christmas period out of lockdown, we might just do a lot of private ones now. Um, so it might not be until January for our next sort of group whiskey tasting like this um but remember you've got your tasting cards there you'll see you've got 15 percent off any bottle orders from tonight so it's a big discount um anything that you fancy just drop us a dm or an email um, and we'll get those bottles ordered in um and we actually do need to place a japanese order quite soon because we, we've run out so <laughs> uh we need to get that in and um but other than that it's uh, again thank you all for joining us uh thanks again to stephanie and nathan and uh we shall see you guys at the, uh, the next one yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, guys. Thanks for spending.